welcome. Uh, I'm Nicole Sanford, Ella Group's Executive Vice President and Board Services Leader. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, part of a series of virtual Ella Group events that have been created as a forum for discussions of leadership and resilience during the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic. I encourage you to listen to the replays of earlier events hosted by myself and Elig Group CEO, Janice Elig, uh, which can be found on the Our Thoughts page of Elig Group's website. Today's topic is leading from the front, inspiring stories of COVID-19 leadership. We're going to explore examples of visionary corporate leaders, their responses to these challenging times and lessons about leadership that we can all learn from. And I couldn't have a better person for this conversation than Dr. Jeffrey Sonnenfeld. Professor Sonnenfeld is the Senior Associate Dean of Leadership Programs and Lester Crown Professor in the Practice of Management for the Yale School of Management. He is also the founder and president of the Chief Executive Leadership Institute, a nonprofit educational research institute focused on CEO leadership and corporate governance. He has also authored eight books, including The Hero's Farewell, an award-winning study of CEO succession, and another bestseller, Firing Back, a study on leadership resilience in the face of adversity, which has probably never been more valuable than it is now. Professor Sonnenfeld's research has been published in too many places to list here. And uh, as many of us know, he's often called upon by the business press to offer his insights when CEOs and boards are in the news. And so we're very fortunate to have this visionary, highly sought after expert on leadership with us today. Uh, beyond all of that, Jeff, uh, you're also a very good friend. Uh, we've had the opportunity to work together many, many times. Uh, we have great stories that we can tell no one uh, about our, our work together with boards of directors. Uh, so I really do appreciate, uh, from a personal perspective, you joining us today. And look, I learn something every time we're together. So I'm looking forward to seeing what I learned today. Thanks, Thanks. Nicole. It's a, an honor to be with you. And let me be uh, the... Uh, the last, uh, probably to congratulate you among your friends publicly on your great uh, move now to the Elig Group uh, and joining Janice Elig, who is a legend in herself in that great firm in, of professionals. But it's, uh, it's a delight to, to join you. Uh, and I, uh, I apologize that I must have forked over too long a, a CV for you to read through in that bio sketch. So we'll probably have time for one or two minutes of conversation. <laughs> Uh, unless you have a few more pages of the bio you'd like to read, I probably have I it. Think, I think that's it, Jeff. That's it. I should um, also I mean, say that the honor of working with you saved me from um, accepting a CNBC offer to go on just moments ago to go on and debate somebody who's a nemesis of mine in the activist investor world. So you and he threatened to sue me if I'd gone on probably anyway. So thank <laughs> you for saving me and saving my household. Well... <laughs> I, I mean, it, I, I, I guess it's great for you and probably a loss for the world that we didn't get to hear that, but I suspect no. we'll, we'll have another opportunity uh, at another date, I'm sure. Um, just a quick note for everyone that's joining us. Uh, we will take questions throughout the, the um, program, and if we don't get to them all, don't worry. We will uh, regroup after the webinar and get back to you with some thoughts, uh, but please keep them coming. Uh, and with that, Jeff, we're going to dive right in. So I know that you spend most of your day uh, talking to and advising CEOs. Uh, and I just wanted to start by getting you to share with us, you know, who are the ones that are inspiring you right now? What are they doing right uh, that we can all learn from? Uh, well, thanks. I, I think there are some uh, tremendous examples out there uh, that if we were to, to think of, of, of the things that they're doing, and you and I were just deb debating Brian Chetsky of, uh, of Airbnb, okay. And since uh, we argued about it uh, offline, you probably thought I'll be nice and not bring it up. Uh, <laughs> but as with most cases, you were right. The more I looked into it, the, the more I realized he is an admirable example. So we should include him on the list of what Airbnb is doing. Uh, but what Wait, we- Did you just admit that I was right? I have to uh, mark the date and time now. This is not being recorded, is it? Oh no, oh no. No, but you seriously, uh, you were, I thought it was uh, a, uh, the HR version of greenwashing in the environmental space, that it was a lot of, uh, of public relations blather. It turns out it's much more substantive and much more uh, that, than the others are doing in the Silicon Valley space where there are layoffs. At, at Airbnb, as the example which you raised uh, for me uh, to educate me, was uh, they laid off about 25% of their 7,500 workers, uh, which is a big hit to them. But it wasn't just that they listed the names and their skill sets and put it out there as an outplacement opportunity, 
but they went and did so much more in terms of providing some skills for adjustment and relocation, but also of providing some continuity in their, their COBRA benefits for the next 18 months uh, to come up with, uh, with a, a con continuity of salary, which I, I think is very important in a number of these situations where they were providing, uh, I, I, I think uh, maybe uh, six months or so, uh, plus another uh, week for, uh, for um, every month you've been with them. I think it's really been quite generous in the continuity. Uh, we've seen Starbucks was paying people. Uh, Kevin Johnson, uh, who did a, a, a very good job. Uh, and it's kind of interesting uh, because uh, his legendary, uh, we, we call him the entrepreneur, but the guy who recreated Howard Schultz of Starbucks and made it what it is today, has been surprisingly silent as had been till last week, uh, Warren Buffett, a uh, uh, week and a half ago, Bill Gates mm -hmm. till about two, three weeks ago, and they've been very good since. Jamie Dimon, who was quite in going through recovery from surgery, a lot of the usual voices weren't there, so we saw a new generation rise up. And, and uh, Brian Chesky of Airbnb is an example of one of them. I think Kevin Johnson of, of, of Starbucks would uh, say, you get paid whether or not you show up or not, was a, another great example. The uh, taking a look at some of the other fine things that Doug McMillan at Walmart has done, uh, taking a look at what, in the midst of a transition at IBM, Ginny Rometty, uh, and as, as Arvin is coming in as her successor, is that uh, we have seen that they've done a fantastic uh, job in terms of uh, communications with their workforce, also some philanthropic things we can talk about later. Uh, and But what we have uh, seen are people with the CEOs of waste management, uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, array of people, uh, even uh, James uh, Gorman, who's not always considered the warm and fuzziest, the CEO of Mor Morgan Stanley, was there, and uh, while he himself was suffering, uh, provided workforce stability. Alan Jope, the CEO of Unilever, uh, has uh, promised to, uh, to, to uh, provide a, 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 a basically a protection of its uh, employment for at least up to three months. Uh, and uh, uh, these are, uh, I think, uh, some of the examples. Uh, Albertson's uh, uh, Amazon. Uh, but what you want them to do is one thing is to take a look at what's the impact on the workforce uh, uh, in terms of employment stability. Another category to look at is what's called the impact on the work process. And if we have time in this call, we could discuss, we can talk about the work process, how they do with isolation, information, gossip, and that kind of thing, and how their work rules are changed for those whose work opportunities changed for those who still have employment. Uh, another issue has to do uh, with the philanthropic outreach. What are they doing for social impact in the communities, which is terribly important. There are an awful lot of great models, heroic models of leadership there, which again, we could talk about depending on, you know, how much, we're going till three o'clock or four o'clock today, I think. <laughs> There's a, there, are a, there are a lot of things that have been done there, donating uh, millions of, of masks and research done by uh, the Regeneron and Gilead giving the drugs away. Uh, Merck, Johnson & Johnson have been doing a fantastic job on research, not trying to opportunistically ex uh, exploit this, uh, this uh, catastrophe. Uh, companies uh, from uh, Microsoft to, uh, to IBM and, and, and Apple and, and even my, uh, my friend Elon Musk in terms of the generosity of giving away the PPE, the, the personal protection equipment and working on ventilators. I think Mary Barrow was given a very tough time by the administration, but has done a remarkable job at GM for turning around what they could do both for PPE production, but retrofitting for ventilator production that we now perhaps have way more than ventilators than even we perhaps need because of things heroically done like that. Sorry you asked, but you know, <laughs> well, you one more category, that, yeah. which really has to do with the area of trust and societal right. impact, is these yeah. leaders, you know, it isn't just smoky boardrooms, it's not going off to business round table or, or, or US Chamber of Commerce meetings, is that their role in terms of viral messaging, as you could say, public messaging has been very important. On the 12th of March, before any of these lockdowns happened, we saw the biggest crash in American history since 1929 on the stock markets on the 12th. Right. On the 13th, uh, they, it was getting worse. And the longer the president spoke, unfortunately, the more the market crashed further until minutes before the close of the market of all weird ironies on Friday the 13th, look it up, check it out. The market mm -hmm. around for the biggest rebound in American history in the last 20 minutes, biggest rebound. How did that happen? It's because a dozen CEOs came out there and spoke truth. They weren't out there for, for cheerleading for any political figure. They weren't coming up with homilies for their workforce. 
they spoke truths about what needed to be addressed about about a testing about the impact and and all the rest and that that reassurance was hugely important right right well you brought up a lot of things that i actually want to go back to if that's okay um let's let's start with the question around i know you've been such a wonderful advocate for women leaders uh one of the many many things that people admire and and know about you um and you mentioned uh mary barra from uh general motors um, what other lessons uh, or what else have you seen uh, from women leaders, either from government or from, from business uh, leadership models? And, you know, while you're, while you're on that topic, I will say that we've had a lot of discussion in various forums about the sort of backsliding that sometimes happens in a downturn. Women leaders make great strides in, an, in a boom economy and then the wagons get circled and they're somehow on the outside looking in. So two questions. Uh, what do you think about what we're seeing from our, our women leaders? Uh, that's the first question. And how do we prevent that backslide from happening? Um, that's question number two. Well, uh, that's, a, again, uh, not only worthy of a half-hour discussion, that's worthy of a semester course all by itself. <laughs> so, again, stop me when you just can't stand it anymore. Uh, but it, uh, there is always a danger, and we're seeing some possible signs of this now, where the uncertainty and the confusion leads people to clamp down, circle the wagons, go for the familiar, which often means when they come to a firm like Ellig or others uh, that they might be asking for more of the same, uh, the same profile as to who's on the board, who's in leadership roles. We saw a couple of fantastic, you know, high profile women leaders step down recently in a normal succession. Ginny Rometty, say of IBM, which we were talking about Indra uh, a little bit before that, uh, uh, at, of course at, at PepsiCo. And it's sort of painful every time we see one of these losses. But the good news here is in terms of the numbers, which are creaky slow, we are at a high. We have 30 women leading Fortune, somehow leading Fortune 500 firms. And it's, uh, you know, some unexpected, uh, some unexpected uh, places where we've seen them in technology and aerospace and things. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, something that you and Janice work on very hard. We've seen very marginal, but at least directionally, you know, progress continuing right now in terms of board roles. We're up to maybe 17% of board positions from 15% two years ago. <laughs> I think only 5% are, are, board, are, women, are board chairs, but still we're making that progress. But still, what, where's the opportunity in all this if we're seeing people possibly clamp down? You take a look on the national level, the, the, the women heads of state, it's off the charts. There are only 7% of the world's uh, heads of state are women. And yet you look at uh, New Zealand, uh, look at Denmark, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Germany, uh, uh, Finland. Uh, these, uh, these are the companies that are doing, the countries, doing the best job of, of managing this crisis, managing the pandemic. They're showing extraordinary skills at, at resilience, at uh, not getting into macho battles o over different ideological models that we're seeing, sadly. There's some interesting research, and again, I, I won't read it to you right now, just in the interest of time, but going past just Germany, Ireland, New Zealand, Norway, Iceland, Denmark, or Finland, the countries doing the best, just happen to be led by women, is mm -hmm. OECD studies and a McKinsey study have, uh, have shown that more equitable gender balance in those countries uh, uh, correspond with a lot of these dimensions, that these are countries where in the metrics of the OECD and McKinsey independently are considered much more uh, equitable representation of women in senior leadership roles, and how wonderful it is that they are managing this crisis so much better. So there's a huge message there, I think, mm -hmm. about the opportunity for bringing women into crisis management situations, uh, not to say that any gender has a monopoly on better leadership. You and I have talked about some some just awful women leaders, but certainly uh, women who have been battle tested in this experience can prove that women not only do just as well, but maybe are doing a little bit better than the guys are in managing this uh, this great historic pandemic crisis. Right, right. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, it sounds like what you're saying in, in there also is that perhaps we have reached a tipping point, a uh, critical mass in the boardroom uh, and with uh, power in various places, uh, both in government and in, in um, corporations, that the backslide uh, won't be allowed or won't be tolerated. Well, the two things that I didn't see, didn't say, because I wouldn't say these to you now publicly in this forum because they're too easily misinterpreted, and that I didn't say anything about work-life balance, which I've seen people talk about. 
because hold it, why has that become the woman's issue? Uh, isn't there anybody else in the family also who has responsibilities? But but there's, in fact, looking at it, we're seeing that with with um, both genders at home or what everybody at home, right, whatever the gender issues are, is that uh, partners are together at home and there's a more equitable sharing of home duties now, which so, in fact, uh, that's a, a another positive. And plus, I don't think any gender has a monopoly on caring and empathy and all the rest. And yet, uh, we're, we are seeing that uh, these are often skills that are associated with many women leaders, that mm -hmm. care, clarity of messaging and empathy are so important at this time that it, it's in addition to the crisis management issues, but I don't mean to prolong mm -hmm. this topic. Yeah, well, I will say for, for men on our webinar that are interested in helping be uh, part of the solution and help, uh, help um, prevent the backslide, um, I read a great book that I picked oh, up at one of your sessions, the uh, best. Whitman's book. Um, that's what she said, which I, I read once and I went right back to the beginning to read it again. Um, because what it, were, it was really uh, eye-opening to me because it taught me that maybe I had always perceived some of this to be on purpose. Like even the term wagon circling implies that there's some conscious part of this. But I think that um, what I'm convinced of now is that it's not a conscious uh, uh, you know, um, effort, that it's more deeply seated in the unconscious bias. So great book to read. Thank you for um, introducing me to it. And uh, anybody who is looking to be part of the solution, I highly recommend it. Um, but it while is a we're, fantastic book. And I'm so glad, uh, I'm so glad you showcased it by saying any men who want to learn more about this, because so many people think wrongly that Joanne wrote the book uh, as a self-help guide to women. No, it mm -hmm. is to the rest of us is to help men better understand how to communicate, which is why I waited until you were done speaking before <laughs> to, to try to not interrupt you. Yeah, I think it's um, men and anyone who really has been charged by their organization uh, around this issue. It's a great, uh, great way to, to really look at and think about the issues in a little bit different way. Um, we shift gears just a little bit and talk about one of your favorite topics, which is um, resilience. Um, you know, not everyone has been perfect from day one. Uh, I have to be honest with you, some of the early messages that I saw from CEOs, I thought, you know, really fell flat and were de uh, tone deaf. Um, but you you believe more than anybody that it's never too late to, to change course. It's never too late to recover. Uh, talk about what you've learned about resilience and how can people who maybe in companies that have maybe misstepped a little bit, um, you know, some examples either from this crisis or the past, uh, how did they gather up and turn, turn around? Well, as you're talking about books, it just happened. This is a real library and not just a fake backdrop. Uh, is uh, I have a book called Firing Back on Overcoming Adversity. Uh, uh, by the way, just I have to make a joke. I'm sorry. I have the book, but I gave it to somebody that they really Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. Oh, go. Well, that's good. Great. They never, they never gave it back, so they must have loved it, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, good. Well, in there, we talk about the, the critical lessons on, on overcoming adversity. And one of them has to do with acknowledging the problem, not sweeping it under the carpet with cliches like tomorrow's another day, take your lumps and that kind of thing, is that the research on post-traumatic stress disorder says that we've seen at Johns Hopkins and at Yale and elsewhere, and victims of uh, natural disasters or battlefields, is you have to acknowledge the problem that yoga is great, Tai Chi is wonderful, uh, but you have to acknowledge the problem and not just go for stress displacement. Uh, and how do you repair a stress problem? It's like telling somebody who has a drug problem, have you tried drinking? Don't go for a substitution, go to repair it and bring others into the equation, which is another challenge right now, is that nobody should feel isolated. How do we bridge that problem? Another one has to do with, if you get something wrong, how do you correct it, either by a, a authentic apologies or showing you're not gonna do it again or explain it wasn't an error and go for an exoneration and not, not dwelling on, on a misstep. But these are things we could go into in, in more depth if I was trying to hawk the book. But instead, I wanna talk to the specifics rather than my book, uh, because you're nice enough to give me the chance to talk about, since we probably shouldn't name names, like a guy named Fabrizio Gallo, who I never met, who is the head of equities, uh, global equities, uh, at Bank of America. On March 25th, after the lockdowns began, in the midst of all this, he put out the unfortunate messaging that I, am, I can't feel sorry for anybody who says, I can't show up because I'm too worried and stressed out, and said, if you basically want a job here at Bank of America, you need to show up and be here. Uh, and it was uh, many implied threats. Of course, this had to be corrected. Uh, Brian Moynihan, his boss, the CEO, is an excellent CEO. 
uh, they had to correct themselves on the on the PPP rollout where things got a little overwhelmed as to who was going to get what. And I think Bank of America is a very good example of a misstep uh, that wasn't fatal, and they they recovered on it on many fronts. And I, I admire Brian Moynihan enormously. There are some other missteps that have to do with tying in with, like I said, uh, not going for the cliches. Is there were CEOs who were re immediately putting out these long, tedious, ponderous messages to employees, customers, uh, tomorrow's another day, we'll get through this, this too shall pass. Oh yeah, when and at what cost and how? And don't write nonsense like that. Nobody needs to hear it. It's, you're not informing anybody of anything. And you're kind of wading through all that nonsense to see if there's a pony in there somewhere to be worth all, all the stuff that you're shoveling at them. Is so, uh, but also avoid stressing people out with the hand wringing. Give them something substantive. Uh, the positive side of all this is the CEO of McKinsey uh, is uh, uh, Kevin Nieder said that part of the reason is as business leaders, as professionals, we tend to want to try to be optimists and to think we can fix any problem. So sometimes we rush a solution too quickly. Uh, and maybe that's why we, it looks like we paper things over. I know in teaching a course on careers for, uh, for many years at the evil Harvard Business School, where I was working behind enemy lines for, for, uh, for a long time, is, uh, uh, is that I used to have uh, students write career papers. Uh, and they often would talk about tragic things that happened to them as a great learning experience. It was amazing how really healthy people would talk about some horrible catastrophe as something redemptive from it. And, and Andrew Young, the, uh, the Ambassador Young, uh, the uh, tremendous civil rights leader and public official and um, UN ambassador and things, and mayor of Atlanta and congressman, talked about how in every religion there's something redemptive from tragedy. That's all true, but we don't want to rush to that until we take a look at the solutions. So was, for example, Joe Ukazoglu of Deloitte had, had told me, uh, that some people were, were advocating for saying, we'll be back to business as usual we, when we had no idea what was coming. And you should go to this country. You should go to that country when we didn't really know. And what Joe says is we need to tell our people, here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. And here's how we're going to find it out. But consult whatever experts you want. Here are the experts we're recommending. Uh, that uh, Kevin uh, Nieder at, uh, uh, at, back at McKinsey was just saying how every Thursday, they have a, a, a long town hall meeting. Well, he'll meet with, the, with an employee, a, 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 but the whole company watches it. And the 75% with regards to the time zone of McKinsey people were watching that live. And uh, at uh, Deloitte, they're doing a similar thing on, on Fridays, but also having round the, uh, round the clock uh, Q and A's that, that are open for everybody to see. They, somehow you have to deal with that isolation, have to deal with the rumor control issues. And if somebody messes up, like I mentioned in the Bank of America example, give them another chance. That this is a new crisis for us, and we have to learn how to manage in this this new normal. Perhaps uh, you know I'm so worried as we uh, running out of time that I, I could go on too long on this one. But uh, let, let me uh, <laughs> let well, you. Well, I, I I love everything you said because I mean I know Joe personally, and it's that authentic leadership of not trying to pretend that you know everything. Uh, and we had an interesting webinar a few weeks ago, Janice um, talked with um, one of our, our uh, Lions partners, Culture and Tell, about um, the generational differences and how people are um, dealing with this crisis differently. And I think there's some leadership lessons there for CEOs who are trying to communicate with a different generation who are not really interested in this two shall pass quite yet. They're, they're living this in a way that, that, you know, they've never faced anything any, anywhere near like this. So um, all good points. No, that is that is really critical. And there's a, an area, which is another topic, which is probably too much for to get into, but you might want, want to handle in a chat later, is um, that, that CEOs are very frustrated, as are all of us, in the volume of meetings. I yeah. love this uh, exchange right now, and I hope somebody is listening to it besides the two of us, but if it's just the two of us, I'm loving it. <laughs> However, um, there are too many meetings, too many meetings that are, that are coached and couched and branded as, as COVID-19 somehow meetings. Everybody wants to look like they're an essential employee. Too mm -hmm. many meetings, they're running too long with too many people in them. And maybe it's some of the isolation of what it is, but we almost feel like we're tethered to this electronic ball and chain. We can't get 10 feet away from the laptop. And when we had all this extensive, you know, commuting travel and traffic issues and everything else, if somehow we felt we had more time, we have less time now and we're not even leaving other than get a shower and some food and see who else is in the house. Right. We have a, an audience question that I want to jump into um, about, um, you know, the effect of the crisis and COVID-19 on the kinds of skills and leadership attributes that boards and senior executive teams might be looking for in the future. How might that change? Um, and I think we've 
we've seen that and often is the case post-crisis that there is a wave towards something um, after the Enron and Sarbanes-Oxley era, it was a race to financial literacy. After the, the financial crisis, there was a lot of talk about risk management and industry experience. What do you think is next? What, what are we gonna learn um, that we need more of in the boardroom and in the C-suite? Well, uh, I, I, I don't wanna sound too Pollyanna-ish here, but it is, it's an excellent question. But there is, and I don't wanna sound dismissive by saying there's a silver lining in all this, but there is a, a justification of the, of the Business Roundtable's rediscovery of what was their founding position in 1970. 50 years ago, although nobody in the media seems to know this, 50 years ago, the Business Roundtable's generation was to take a look at social impact issues. They broke away from the US Chamber of Commerce and other groups because those leaders at IBM and, and DuPont and, and, and Exxon, and I knew them all well, had, uh, had created the Business Roundtable, in fact, because they, wanted, they were concerned uh, about their, their citizenship roles. As the George Weyerhaeuser told me, the, uh, the, the, the former CEO of Weyerhaeuser, of course, said we have a license to operate from society, we can violate the terms of it and have the license revoked. That was the counter the Milton Friedman often repeated and somewhat distorted statement about the only, the, the only concern is the bottom line, the only responsibility is the bottom line. So that broadening across other constituencies, other stakeholders, it's, it is du jour right now. We can see the impact on communities, employees, and others. That's critical. And part and parcel with that, Helena Folks, who was uh, till quite recently, until they just went private, the CEO of Hudson's Bays, which was like, you know, Saxmith Avenue and stuff. She, uh, she told me that uh, what uh, another skill set that's just so critical that's come to the fore in boardrooms is understanding compassion and safety that that really matters instead of being a tertiary uh, concern. Uh, Jim um, 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 McCann, the CEO of, uh, of 1 and founder of 1-800-Flowers, has also pointed out that the, the technological disruption that we talk about to the point of cliche, uh, they said the things that were happening in retail over the next five years have all happened in the last two months, three months. So that we have this accelerated digitalization. So how we understand, obviously for the university world too, we have to re re you know, wrestle with the hybridized notion of what technology is going to mean in terms of how we harmonize it with proximity in person, uh, selling in person, teaching in person, communicating and, and manufacturing. Well, we have another question. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I do want to take this question because it's such a good one. And I think uh, those of us who watch the news and see the commercials in between, you know, struggle with this question quite a bit, which is, um, how, on the philanthropy side, um, how do you distinguish between C-suites uh, doing good for good's sake and doing so um, to create an image or to help their image? How do you help companies, when you're talking to CEOs, how do you help them decide between do this, not that, um, from a philanthropy stand standpoint? Well, that's, uh, that is a good question. I'm glad you, you close on it because it really has to do with um, uh, the mission of the company uh, again, beyond just the short-term shareholder returns, is how do they show that they're not trying to, to brand and publicize uh, and drain uh, an advertising return out of every good deed done? That there are an awful lot of things that are being done out there where there isn't any immediate discernible return to the company short-term, but it has to do with the larger societal context. Uh, there are uh, companies that are, are, um, are exploiting this, that are, um, Sometimes, you know, you see them coming on and, and selling their, their, their uh, heating and ventilating HVAC services and tell you, should you need us, we're here for you, trying to drench it and we're all family, but all they're doing is twisting your arms, selling their services. Uh, that comes off uh, cynically, it comes off as, as exploitive. And I think that the, the uh, employees, the uh, customers, the general American public, public officials, they can see through all right through that. If it's some, something has to do with fundamentally building trust is what's there. Jim Burke had, uh, uh, had uh, talked about uh, the recovery of, of Tylenol and Johnson & Johnson in an earlier era, and that he said that we had this great legacy, we realized that every act we made was going to fortify the most valuable thing we have, which is public trust, and that every, everything that we do, which is reckless, can, can uh, absolutely destroy uh, uh, decades uh, of, of, of that value. Thomas More said just before um, just before he got uh, decapitated uh, as an advisor, King Henry VIII said that trust uh, is uh, character is as fragile as having a liquid cupped in your hands 
And once you separate the fingers, it's forever gone. There are some companies right now that are, that are acting recklessly, a few, and that is uh, definitely degrading and eroding trust. And people are going to remember that. Those who are working in a larger public interest as well as the, the interest of their enterprise will be remembered, I think, and, and will, be, uh, will be fortified in the marketplace afterwards. It, it will be rewarded in the here and now, not just the hereafter. Right. right. That's all great advice, as always. Uh, I'm going to give you a last word here before we wrap up. The last uh, pieces of advice to share with folks around um, boards and CEOs and what are they going to be doing differently in the future as, in response to what we're facing here? Uh, you know, we, we watch every day uh, as to whether or not uh, we're going to have a V-shaped or an L-shaped or what kind of a rebound they're going to be. And is there a second wave? Is it going to be plateaued? Depending on your political party, your ideology, we learned these different lessons from different pandemics. Was it the, uh, uh, the yellow fever of, 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 of 1768, or is it the, the, uh, the 1918 uh, Spanish flu, or is it the, uh, the, uh, the, the Asian flu uh, of 1958, or is it uh, the Hong Kong flu of 1968? Is everybody's looking at the different data. And the issue is, uh, that we should be not trying to just fight the battles of the past. This is a, a problem, pathology of many generals. What are the problems going forward? We have enough unique problems today. We don't need to point fingers. We don't need to be divisive this way. Uh, I, I think when, when CEOs speak out and say, there are some obvious truths, we need to work on testing, not let testing, not let PPE, the personal protection devices, become political statements. CEOs that have spoke out, whether or not it was Walmart or UPS or, uh, uh, or AT&T that were these um, um, mainstream bedrock companies are the ones who spoke out against these divisive, uh, as they were euphemistically called, the bathroom bills uh, that were in Arkansas and North Carolina and Indiana. They were just divisive things. CEOs said, look, we don't like to get involved politically. Ken Fraser and Mark, of course, one of the best of these, is that we need to stand for social harmony. We do better and we all work together. And I think that's and a very important message here is how do we how do we bring our stray ends together and not look backwards and also recognize there's some industries whether that's the film industry or the the fun is industries of travel or the fashion industries which will be forever changed from this so their new normal might be the hardest and we don't want to make it seem like every industry has the same problem right right very well said um great parting words for us since we're running a little bit over uh, as i said at the beginning uh, jeff and i will go back through. If we didn't have a chance to answer your question, do not fear. We will, uh, we will uh, regroup on those at, a, at another time. Uh, and I would also ask that you mark your calendar and pre-register for our next webinar, uh, which is on May 18th at 3 p.m. Um, Janice Ellig will be joined by Melinda White, the CEO of Transit Wireless, to talk about running an essential New York, New York City-based business during the COVID-19 pandemic, which um, should, is on the minds of all of us uh, in the tri-state area for sure. Uh, Jeff, thank you again for your time and as always for your leadership and your, your words of wisdom and please take good care and, and I'll hopefully see you in person soon.